Aquaman and the Last Kingdom is wrapping up the DCEU, and in the words of apparently the executives at Warner Brothers, let's just get this over with. This video is brought to you by Stamps.com. Go to Stamps.com and enter promo code MERLE for a special offer, and stay tuned after this review for more info. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle. On the road, I'm visiting family, so I am in the best corner of the place that I can find. It's actually nice, we got a lamp here, we got a painting here. I've been in hotel rooms that are a lot worse, but we're not here to talk about my surroundings. We're here to talk about Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. James Wan returns to direct with the screenplay from David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick, who co-wrote 2018's Aquaman and now takes on screenwriting duties alone for the sequel. This is the last movie in the DC Extended Universe, and it has been a strange 10 years when you look back on this entire decade-long journey. It started with Man of Steel back in 2013. I was just an editor at Screen Junkies at the time, and the coverage that we've done, multiple Comic-Cons and the trailers for things like Batman v Superman and The Suicide Squad. I filed two police reports because of the reaction to various reviews that I did of DCEU films, and here we are at the end with Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, and it's not exactly where I predicted my ending for the DC Universe would be, or at least this iteration of the DC Universe, in a theater in South Carolina with my cousin and about a dozen other, what I can only describe as apathetic theater goers. Jason Momoa returns one last time as Aquaman, bored on his throne as King of Atlantis, not Jason Momoa, the character. But Aquaman's world is shaken by the return of his old enemy Black Manta, played by Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, who's wielding the power of the Black Trident, an ancient weapon created by the King of Necris, the Lost Kingdom, to reshape the planet. In order to defeat this evil, Aquaman frees and then teams up with his brother Orm, played by Patrick Wilson, as they fight together to protect both the surfaced and the oceans. Nicole Kidman and Tumuera Morrison also reprise their roles, although they don't really have much to do. Dolph Lundgren and Randall Park get expanded roles, and yes, Amber Heard is in this film for what I would describe as a medium amount of time. If you are upset by the fact that Amber Heard is in this film for more than just a couple of scenes, if it's any consolation for you, she is terrible in this movie. No actor could really do much with the material that she's given, but she doesn't exactly transcend the written word either. The frustrating thing about the first Aquaman movie, and almost doubly for me in this one, is that this is not a world that is unimaginative or that was low effort in any way. This is actually a really creative, rich, and vibrant universe that's been created for this character. And there were several times watching this movie where I thought, well, you know what? I've never seen that before, similar to the octopus drum player in the last film. Jason Momoa is also a really energetic lead, and he does his best to make Aquaman a great character. But both of these movies have been utterly let down by their screenplays. And this one, I think, is worse than the first one. There are higher highs. I think that the high points in this Aquaman movie worked more for me than anything in the first movie, but the lows are also lower. The script is so derivative in so many places with character beats and things that we've seen in other comic book movies before, but wrapped in this incredibly original world. And it's really just like, ah, uh, there's so much potential there. There's so much that could have been done with this universe, that could have been done with this character and with Jason Momoa as this character. And it's just squandered. And it's not just because the DCEU is coming to an end, even if the universe was going to continue, I would feel the same way. And, and it's why I was so torn on the first Aquaman movie as well. I saw a lot of potential there. I thought the story held it back. I think it's even more so in this movie. And if I were James Wan and some of the artisans that crafted this universe, I would feel let down by the people that I trusted to write the screenplays and to come up with the stories for these films because they just can't live up to the originality of the world that's created here. I was actually enjoying this film for most of its second act, which is largely given over to Patrick Wilson and Jason Momoa as a buddy comedy between Aquaman and Orm as they explore their love-hate relationship. 
Patrick Wilson is great as Orm. I think that he's easily the best actor in this movie, but in his scenes with Jason Momoa, he also brings out the best in Momoa as they sort of poke and prod each other with this odd couple type of energy. The movie was really working for me. And in the second act, they also get to fight in a cool James Bond type volcano lair. There's some impressive production design, some cool practical sets. For about half an hour, I thought, you know what? This isn't great, but maybe this movie might actually send the DCU out on some kind of a high note, maybe an Arrested Development kitty type, you know, say goodbye to these, where you're actually seeing like, oh, we might actually be missing out on something with these movies not continuing, but that's just not the case. Everything before and after the second act is a mess. The movie is packed with exposition dump scenes that are either voiceover, flashback, voiceover over flashback, or just a group of characters standing in a circle telling the plot to each other. And this movie really, to me, is more notable for what it could have been if they could have focused the movie on the brothers. You can still bring Black Manta in because he's really driving that conflict and he's what brings them back together in the first place. And you have a much smaller film and a little bit more of a character-driven film, then I think this would have been a much better film. But there is this thing, and I don't understand it, with so many people that write comic book movies, that it has to be big, and it can't be enough to just be a conflict between two or three people. It's got to be a world-threatening thing, and this big mythology-building connection that goes all the way back to the beginning. And so what happens is this movie basically wraps up in Act 2, and then ramps up again in Act 3 for a completely different conflict that ditches so much of what's been working about the movie. And so we basically go from what I think is a really kind of an entertaining film to a bigger but not better version of what we've been watching that gets rid of everything that's already working in the movie. The screenplay ignores the rule of show don't tell a lot and it also ignores simple things like setup and payoff. Multiple times in the movie, we are told that this fuel source called orichalcum, which when burned causes global warming, just don't ask. We're told that it is very unstable, and characters even say things like, hey, be careful with that orichalcum because it, it'll explode if you handle it too roughly, or hey, w what are you doing? Stay away from that fuel. What are you trying to kill all of us? The movie goes out of its way to say, hey, this thing right here is really super dangerous, and if you mess around with it, it's going to really cause a spectacular explosion, and then the movie never does anything with it. There's no payoff to it. It's just a setup that doesn't go anywhere because they ditch that whole storyline and move on to something else. I mean, this is pretty basic screenwriting stuff. And listen, I'm not a professional screenwriter. I don't get paid to write movies, but I do get paid in a, in a way to watch movies and to comment on movies. And yes, I do notice these things. Now, maybe this was the product of rewrites. Maybe there was an original version of this screenplay that was smaller and they said, no, you You've got to add a much bigger third act, but still, you can remove those relics from other versions of the screenplay. I don't really quite know what the form of this movie was originally, but that's kind of a problem in and of itself, and it's been a problem with the DC movies, with the Marvel movies lately, where you see the kernel of what the movie was before 18 people weighed in on it and made it something worse. Principal photography supposedly has been wrapped on this movie for nearly two years, and reportedly there were multiple Batman cameos with different Batmen that were shot for the film under different executives. There are zero Batmen in the movie, by the way, nor are there DC superheroes from any part of the universe other than the Aquaman universe. They decided not to connect this with any other movie, I guess because they decided that it was the end. And even the actual ending of the movie is very odd. There are elements of it that are taken from a very prominent Marvel film, and even the very last line of the movie, it, it seems like they're almost trolling the MCU, but it doesn't really quite work. It's like they put a camera on Jason Momoa and they were like, okay, I want you to try 10 different lines and it's gonna be the last line of the movie and we're just gonna pick whichever one works best. It's like the movie ends on an exasperated sigh that you can feel from the editing bay all the way out into the movie theater as if they finally just said, you know what? <sighs> Just put in whatever and let's get it over with. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, despite some highlights to some extent, feels like the quiet quitting of the DCEU. It's a muted farewell that's as obligatory as anything else. And it's a real shame because like the rest of the DC universe that's coming to a close here, 
This movie and the other Aquaman movies had real potential, but it seems like tinkering and second guessing and interference and rewriting squandered that potential. And what we're left with is something that's promising, but ultimately disappointing. So while I enjoyed part of this movie, much like the first Aquaman, ultimately Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom gets a not a fan rating from me. And that brings this chapter of the DC story to a close. What do you think? Are you going to go one last time to see this film in theaters? Let me know down in the comments below. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor for this video. This video is brought to you by Stamps.com. We are in the final crunch of the holiday shopping season, and it's very possible that you still have some last-minute gifts to send. Why stress out with the holiday traffic and long lines at the post office when you can send your packages right from home with Stamps.com? Stamps.com is your own personal post office. All you need is a computer and printer, and you can leave that scale off that letter to Santa because they'll provide one for you. And with the Stamps.com mobile app, you can take care of all of your orders orders, and schedule package pickups on the go. Stamps.com has been helping customers save time and money during the holidays for 25 years with easy access to USPS and UPS services and premium rates for all of your postage needs. Why make the holidays even harder when Stamps.com can help share the workload? And if you're looking for the perfect gift for somebody who sends a lot of stuff, maybe a small business owner, Stamps.com is a great resource. They provide carrier discounts up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates, and Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. Give your business the gift of Stamps.com so your mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season. Sign up with promo code MERL for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code MERL. Thanks to Stamps.com for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching. Be sure to stay tuned right here. I will have a review soon for Rebel Moon Part 1, the latest film from Zack Snyder, as well as a few other things. And then as we get closer to the end of the year, I will be working on my best and worst list for 2023. Until next time, stay safe and I'll see you then. Bye.